Today's video, we're going to talk about enzymes, and we're going to combine IB sections 3.6 in the high-level option 7.6 in this video, so that we talk about everything about enzymes that IB requires in one video. So an enzyme is a small molecule that basically helps to speed up reactions inside of an organism or inside your body. Uh, for a reaction to occur, it requires a certain amount of energy. And that's called our activation energy here. And so in order for this reaction to progress or for it to occur, a certain degree of energy is required for that reaction to actually recur, occur. So we have some reactants. After activation energy is provided, we get some products. We lose some heat during that reaction. Uh, enzymes basically provide a means to lower that activation energy of the chemical reaction. Um, and they help to catalyze or to speed up that reaction. And so here, this is a nice graph that shows us really how this is working. Um, moving up our y-axis here, we've got more energy. And so our activation energy normally is this red line here. This is without an enzyme. With an enzyme being present, our activation energy is much lower. And so our activation here, uh, energy is much lower. And so the ability for this reaction to occur uh, is much easier. It can occur much faster because less energy is required to actually start that reaction. And so that's what enzymes are allowing uh, organisms to do inside of their cells is they're allow allowing these chemical reactions to occur at a much faster or quicker scale because they are lowering, lowering the amount of energy necessary for the, uh, for the reaction to occur. There's a couple of terms that you need to know that are associated with enzymes and the first is denature, uh, denaturing. And this is basically a change in the structure of the enzyme. Um, it blocks or stops the enzyme from carrying out its functions. The second is metabolic pathways. Uh, metabolic pathways are, are basically chains or cycles of enzyme catalyzed reactions. And so we've got multiple reactions in a row. And all of these reactions are necessary to produce some final product. A good example of this would be like the Calvin cycle or the Krebs cycle, which we'll talk about during photosynthesis and respiration. Those pathways are multi, uh, a multi-step process. And so one reaction causes another to begin. So the products of one reaction are going to cause the next reaction to begin. And we'll look at, we'll look at how that can actually be blocked a little bit later. Um, and so this metabolic pathway is basically just a series of steps or, or a chain of these different enzymes and different reactions that are occurring in a kind of stepwise fashion. So here in our image here, we've got uh, this is quite a few different ones, and you're not meant to be able to read these here. This is just kind of an overview. We've got different uh, metabolic pathways, and, and they're all connected. Really, for one of these to happen, multiple others are going to be able to occur afterwards. Or for one reaction to happen, a previous one has to occur. As we mentioned earlier, an enzyme is a protein, a globular protein, which acts as a catalyst that helps to speed up chemical reactions. Enzymes have something called an active site, and this is the region on the surface of an en enzyme to which substrates bind and uh, which ca uh, catalyzes a chemical reaction with that substrate. The substrate is what is eventually going to become our products. It's the reactant in a biochemical reaction. So here's a nice image that helps to clarify this. Our green right here, this is the enzyme. This is our enzyme. It's a globular protein and it's made of amino acids put together to make that protein. Along comes a substrate and this substrate fits specifically with this particular enzyme. The two of them connect together, and then we still have our enzyme, and then our substrate becomes the product. So this enzyme is, is carrying out this chemical reaction, and it's putting out or it's releasing products. And so once these products move away, the enzyme is now ready for another substrate to appear and to bind and actually to produce another product. And so this is a continual process, and this enzyme can continue to do this to, for a specific amount of time. Uh, we have something to describe how the substrate and the en enzyme stick together or fit together. This is called the induced fit model, or kind of a lock and key. You can imagine this as a lock and a key. We have our enzyme here in the gray, and this is our substrate. And this substrate has a particular shape and orientation and maybe polarity um, so that the substrate fits specifically with this specific enzyme. For example, uh, lactose is a type of sugar. In our bodies, in most people, in our stomachs, we have an enzyme called lactase that fits with lactose and actually helps to break that uh, sugar down into monosaccharides. That enzyme lactase is specific to the sugar lactose. And so that's what we're looking at here. This is the lock and key or, or an induced fit. The substrate fits specifically with this enzyme. So it matches up um, 
the enzyme slightly changes its safe shape so that it binds to the substrate and then the enzyme releases the products and so our lock portion would be like the enzyme the key portion is the substrate the substrate is providing um, that specific structure the enzyme to bond with and so again it can only the enzyme can only connect or bond with a specific substrate to produce the products of the chemical reaction um, the activation site of an enzyme is specific to its substrate enzymes can only catalyze reactions with specific substrates that fit the activation site so if I go back here our activation site or our active site is right here and this is the actual portion of the enzyme where the substrate is binding or is bonding this particular spot right here on the enzyme is where the substrate is binding we call that our active site the enzyme is the lock the substrate is the key so here's another diagram basically outlining and explaining the same process here's our enzyme the active site is where the substrate is going to bond right here and here here's our our substrates they bind with the enzyme and then we produce a product. There's a number of different conditions or, or things that can affect um, that can affect enzymes and, and we're going to look at three of those temperature, pH, and substrate, substrate concentration. The temperature, um, an enzyme activity increases with increased temperature but that only continues to a specific temperature level or a specific uh, degree um, up to a certain point at a certain point if it gets too hot those proteins are going to denature or break down and basically stop working so there's a kind of an optimum range of where the uh, the enzyme is going to be most of effective um, anywhere above that if it gets too hot that that enzyme is going to denature and stop working heat increases rate because it causes molecules to move around faster um, but that's that's up to a certain point and too much heat is going to destroy the bonds of the enzyme and that basically is going to denature that enzyme so it's going to break it down and, and, and make it useless. The other two that we're going to look at is pH um, and depending on the enzyme it also has an op optimum pH. Uh, depending on where that enzyme is located um, most enzymes within the body have a pretty stable um, pH uh, in the degree of about six to eight um, on a pH scale. Opposite of that or, or, or different from that is an enzyme in your stomach uh, your stomach is a very acidic environment and that, and that acid is, is breaking down the food and there are enzymes in your stomach that operate at a pH level of 2. So it's really depending on where the enzyme is located um, but it has a specific range uh, that's going to allow that, that enzyme to function. Um, so it can be an, an acidic or a basic. Uh, if the pH scale is too high, if it's too basic or if it's too acidic, it can also cause that enzyme to denature and break down. The amount of, constant, uh, of substrate or the substrate concentration can also affect the, um, uh, can also influence the effect of uh, the enzyme. Um, enzyme activity increases with increased substrate. So the more substrate that's available, um, the more product that's going to be produced. However, the increase is finite. At a, at a, eventually, at a, at a specific point, when there's too much substrate, there's not enough enzymes or active sites available. And so it gets to a certain point where there's too much substrate around, and there's not enough enzymes to actually process uh, and, and to, to have the chemical reaction occur to produce products from all of that substrate. And so it's, it's at a finite level. Um, we, I discussed earlier lactose and lactase. And lactose, again, is the sugar that's found in milk. Um, lactase is the enzyme that breaks down lactose sugar into monosaccharides uh, of glucose and galactose. So lactose is our sugar. Lactase is the enzyme that breaks down that sugar. You'll notice this enzyme ends in an ASE. Usually the enzyme um, of whatever it's breaking down or whatever the chemical reaction is that it's doing, it, it's very similar to the name of that um, sugar in this example except that its ending is an ACE. And so here's our lactase enzyme in the pink. Here's our lactose sugar. Uh, it fits on this active site. So we have our lock and key, our induced fit. And lactose then breaks apart, uh, excuse me, lactase then breaks apart lactose. Sucrose, for example, another sugar, um, does not fit with that lactase enzyme. So lactase enzyme is not going to be able to break apart sucrose, another disaccharide sugar. Uh, lactose intolerant individuals don't have the enzyme lactase and can't break down the sugar. So you've probably heard before of somebody being lactose intolerant. That basically means that they're not able to break down that lactose sugar, uh, that they're missing or lacking the lactase enzymes in order to do that. 
It's actually uh, possible to make lactose-free milk. Um, this is an example of bioengineering or biotechnology. Basically, principles in biology being used to produce uh, a, a product that can be marketed and sold. So we're using biotechnology. We're using advancements that uh, scientists have made in understanding some of these different reactions and how lactose works and how lactase works. And they're actually making a product that can be sold and actually helps and benefits people. Uh, this is lactose-free milk. And it can be made in two different ways. The first one is uh, enzyme lactase is added to milk so that the purchased product contains the enzyme. So you're actually adding the enzyme to the milk. So because these individuals don't have lactase inside their stomachs, they can't break it down. Well, in this case, it's actually added to the milk. The other way that's, that's very common is to, rather than adding lactase to the milk, um, it's to insert lactase enzymes on a very porous surface, so a surface that uh, liquid can flow through. And then you allow milk to flow over that material. And basically what that does is it creates milk that has the lactose already broken down. So here is a nice uh, image of this. Um, you can zoom in a little bit here. Uh, the milk containing lactose is poured through a surface or over a surface. And these beads have uh, lactase in them. And what we get out of this is a lactose-free milk. And so this is a, another way, and this is probably the more common way, of actually producing lactase, uh, excuse me, lactose-free milk. Out, uh, the, in, or the reaction to the, the catalyst. One way of this is called competitive inhibition. And this results from an inhibitor uh, molecule competing with the substrate for the reaction site. So what we see happen here is uh, here's our normal reaction. We've got our enzyme, we've got a substrate, the substrate and, the, and, and enzyme bind, and so then we get our product. Well, in this sort of example of uh, competition and competitive in inhibition, we've got our inhibitor. example of this is non-competitive inhibition. And in this example, it results from a molecule binding to a different site in the enzyme to change the conformation or to change the position. So again, here's our normal reaction. We've got the enzyme, we've got the substrate, we've got the substrate, we've got the enzyme, we've got the enzyme, we've got the product. In this example, um, we see the substrate, we see our inhibitor, the inhibitor is binding or bonding to this specific site on the enzyme. It's not the active site. It's a different location on the enzyme. And what that's done is it changes the shape. It's changing the shape of our active site. So the substrate comes along and is not able to bind with the enzyme because this inhibitor has changed the shape of the active site. So that's non-competitive inhibition. And a good example of that is uh, the abundance of ATP um, causing it to bind with the enzyme. Um, it causes the enzyme conformation of the shape to change, and so it lowers the rate of the reaction and thus producing less ATP. So if there's lots and lots of ATP and more doesn't need to be reproduced or produced, uh, the ATP inhibiting the enzyme actually slows down the production to decrease the amount of ATP that's available. All of these different meta metabolic pathways, as, as I discussed at the beginning of the video, and these different steps that enzymes carry out, um, they take place in a, in a pathway, basically, or, or a series of steps. Um, and so here's our substrate, and our substrate, in starting this pathway, um, binds with an enzyme, and that enzyme produces some sort of product. And it goes down and down and down, and so there's a multiple step to it. Well, eventually it gets to a point where we have lots and lots of products or end products. And that end product can be a form of feedback inhibition. So that, feed, that, that end product can can basically turn off this metabolic pathway. So here's our metabolic pathway and this product, once there gets to be a point where there's too much product, it can then bind and basically block or shut down the pathway. And so uh, our end product here, uh, if there gets to be too many, uh, it's going to turn off or to stop or to, to, to shut down the pathway. And so it, it stops the enzyme from producing more of these so that's a quick overview of enzymes, uh, metabolic pathways, and